public education in this country, especially in the beginning, the people who formulated public education called themselves, this is going to freak you out. They, they had the attitude that there's a handful of us that are righteous and smart people, and the rest of us are, what do they call them? Okay. The rest, the rest of the population, uh, there's an intelligent minority, and then there are ignorant, meddlesome outsiders who are the general population. <laughs> so the elite must be educated in such a way that they are protected from the roar and trampling of the belligerent herd. All right? I just, I got to fight that. Go ahead. I've been a historian of education. Go ahead. And yes, there are an awful lot of things that I know are wrong with our education system uh -huh. and our history. Okay. However, I don't like untruths perpetuating. Well, and this is me. the United States. The school system in the United States okay. of America right. was established, and we did this before anybody else did, especially in the Northeast, especially in the New England states. Right. From the country's inception, at least in the New England states, every community had a responsibility to contribute to the educate to pay for the education, just the basic education of their children. Okay. Furthermore, they also Point had an point. obligation to help support, in this case, Har Howard Uni Har Harvard University. Forgive me. Next thing, what is the basic idea that got a large public school system going in this country mm -hmm. in the 1820s, 1830s? Horace Mann and the idea of the common school. Uh -huh. What was his idea? Is we want our children educated in a school that is common to all of us, meaning we aren't having private schools for an elite and pauper schools for the poor. Okay. Now, that did happen in the South, but it was not the tradition in New England, and those, that tradition was carried across the country. Right. Now, there are lots of ways that didn't work out, but basically, 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 and I, I, you know, I know a lot about the history of Negro education in the state of New Jersey, and you know all the ways it did not work out. Okay. But I do think that we, I don't like this idea perpetuated, mm -hmm. or I don't. I find it objectionable okay. to say that the public education system in the United States was established primarily to separate the rich from the poor. All right, so you have you have now, you have um, your picture of what the intention of it was. I have a different one, and mine isn't just, mine isn't in concrete. Mine isn't written in stone. I'm willing to. Not just amend it, but throw it out. Mm -hmm. But let's take your perspective and my perspective uh, take on the intent of public education and throw it out the window. My question for you is, how did that shit work out? Um, how did that shit work out in lots of parts of the country? No, that no, in, on, on the whole. Make, a, make an on assessment the of the whole, whole thing. On the whole, right. I think it has worked pretty damn well. And, and I would beg to differ. Right. And maybe that's a, a just a question. Would you address that? And this is what my hope was, was going to be one of the fruits of this kind of discussion, more than any factual conclusions that we come to. That you and I saw something differently and did not become entrenched in the camp of what you said and what I said. Um, the hope is, is that, if nothing else, each one of us became aware of, okay, there's two different ways of looking at that thing. Um, now what do we do? Now what do we do? And we both said, uh, okay. Well, I said, I, I, I'll completely give up my position on this. Let's talk about how it turned out. You know what I mean? So I will stand in front of you and say, you know what? I either got some bad information or brought my personal bias to, um, or my personal experience, to my opinion about the founding of public education. I'll eat that, I'll eat that. How about me and you look at how it turned out and how it is and see what we can do together. 
That's the kind of shit I want to come out of these conversations. You know what I mean? I don't want us to become so firmly entrenched in a camp on something factual or, or not um, that we, we, we can't get past it. You know what I mean? So thank you for the bravery to say, you know what, that thing you just said, I'm not having it. Like, thank, thank you for doing that. And that's what we got to do, man. Like, that's what we got to do. And, and we got to be brave enough to dish it out, and we got to be brave enough to take it. You know what I mean? We got to be brave enough to say, you know what, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I just started to say, a few years ago, I said, you yeah, know, uh, conversation like this and one of the more profound things, I believe this has been going on through our entire history. Exactly. It goes back to enslavement, but um, when we got free labor. But um, I think also a profound example for me was what happened after the Second World War when soldiers returned home mm -hmm. and through our federal government they could yeah. get loans for housing if they were white but not if they were black. And that's the kind of thing our kids need to learn that. That's true. They need to learn that. I mean, we all need to learn that history, but I just, I just think that... One quick thing, um, you mentioned World War II, but in actuality, it was prior to that. Way before. Oh, oh, I know. Because, because right, before, you know, it's because... It's a great example. Right after slavery, you know, yeah. what they call reconstruction that actually turned out to be deconstruction yeah. because that took down even mm -hmm. what we were trying to then accomplish even further. So in a, and this is what we're seeing right now is just another dichotomy of what we've always seen in America. Whenever something comes up and we have the chance to change and to make real differences, we revert to our fears and revert to our ignorance and we elect people like you've seen in the recent past because that somehow brings uh, a comfort to white American consciousness. So what we're seeing right now is that we're all beginning to feel the effects of hundreds of years of this type of suppression. And it won't go away just because we bury our heads in the sand. It's just going to get worse. But this is typical. This is par for the course of American history. And that is why education is critical. Teacher, and I always taught my kids, it's contested. And, and that's why I kind of said, when you said deconstruction, you're absolutely right. But the point is, there's a lot in the legacy of reconstruction that we should celebrate. The first public schools in the South, reconstruction, right? The 14th Amendment, which established the concept of national citizenship, reconstruction. White people, black people work together to address problems. My point is, we're, we're, I, wanna, we're, I want our past to be not just something that we criticize, and we should, but it's also something that's usable. We can learn from it. We can learn how, at top, in other words, it's not linear. It doesn't go straight up, but it also doesn't go straight down. It doesn't stay flat. It goes up in cycles. It goes through cycles. And Reconstruction, I regard as a time of really extraordinary creativity and agency. Let me make my point. Let me make my point. I say it was a deconstruction. Right. because there That's were laws true. put into place, right. the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, which actually worked in the reverse of what it should have done. Yeah. That's a deconstruction. That's not just we didn't level the playing field. Right. We took it back to what it was because now we didn't right. have slaves, but we just called them by a different name. And then we instituted Criminals. other, right. then we, inter we instituted right. other policies <coughs> that continue Right. to denigrate and degrade that particular population. Right. So what I'm saying is it's a deconstruction because we had a chance to even even the playing field right. and we took, we reneged, we gave it and we took it back. Right. That means we had consciousness, we knew what was right, we knew what we should have done, but yet we went back again. Yes. That's a deconstruction. Yeah. That's yeah. nothing constructive. Yeah. That, was, that was deconstructed. All right, let me, well, let, well, let, me hear, let me hear what Curtis said. Go ahead. Are we making any progress? Are things, racial relationships, right. better now than they were 30 years ago, um, 20 years ago, 10 years ago? And now I can see that some people would argue with me and say that they aren't. But I look at, for example, yesterday in the New York Times, full page editorial about time after time after time after time the way a white newspaper would report 
even a modest infraction done by a black as though it was some kind of horrible thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, finally, <coughs> finally, we aren't doing that. Sort of to your point, we, the United States, we won't let that happen. And another thing, now this is, I think this is good. Um, I see ads on television, and I have not done any kind of statistical analysis of this, but it appears to me that the, 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 the skin tone of the people in the ads has darkened considerably. And we have black families in ads just like, you know, like, like they're normal Americans, like they're on end, you know, and like, why did it take us so long to get there? But just yes, money. we yeah. are, we Catering are doing it. Now there, you can say there are arguments, why are we doing it? Because black people have more money now, and they are spending it. But I am inclined to think, forgive me, I'll take argument, that the people who are making these ads and the companies who are paying for them are saying, we have to do better. If we continue the way we have been, we are destroying ourselves. And we have to do better. What can, what can, and I think that each of us, whether we're white or black, or in between, and hallelujah, there are a lot more of us in between, um, say, what can I do? What can I do with my own behavior to try to improve this situation, mm -hmm. to try to lessen these barriers, to try to make, to try to help us understand each other better. That's my speech. Thank you. You use your voice to advocate for change and continue to champion marginalized people, especially when they're not in the room. Especially when they're not in the room. And, and I'm asking that we like be brave enough, before we can even be brave enough to do that, we got to have what happened to Kevin. We got to be aware that it needs to be done. You know, I mean, I, when you were talking, I was thinking, my brother's here. I'm old enough to remember when a black person came on television and hearing my mother yell upstairs to my father, come here, come down here. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. 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 You always saw it on Saturday morning. In terms of uh, negative uh, attitudes and assumptions about black people, I got them. I drive down the street and go, I just want to get a, get a job. You know, <laughs> pull, yeah. pull his pants up. I do that. I'm not proud of that. But I don't have to go too far to reel myself in and understand that that's insane. You know what I mean? That that's insane. And I'm saying that to say that if I have negative, and you can't live in America and, and see the same movies, watch the same television, read the same newspapers that I do, and not have those attitudes, then why would you spend all this time trying to convince me you're not racist? We think racist means you're a bad person. We got to get out of that. Racist means you harbor attitudes about a particular specific group that are incorrect and negative. You ain't got to be a bad person to think that. If I show you on the news every day, every time there's a crime, I just show the ones with black people, why would you not think black people commit crimes? I get it. It's hard to understand that if five out of ten black people uh, committed this crimes, that it means that five out of 10 black people are criminals. Like, we gotta get past that. We gotta get past that. And it's hard to do. You know, it's hard to do. Um, I don't know, solutions. Like, let's talk about some solutions. Over here is we wanna know what we can do. And this is another one of those little creases that doesn't get talked about. Um, on an interpersonal level. You asked, a question I hear a lot of times when I'm talking to somebody white who has every good intention is, what can I do? What can I do to help change stuff? I'm kind of tired of that question. Like, I, I want you to come to me saying, here's what I tried, what else can I do? You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I, I, I get weary sometimes of the heavy lifting of change being placed upon the people 
who are underneath the need for the change. You know what I mean? So um, I was talking to somebody the other day that talked about they were an ally. I'll tell you when you're an ally. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, tell me what you've done, not how you feel. I'm really proud of that Black Lives Matter poster in your yard. But what else have you done? You know what I mean? We got to do stuff. Well, it starts with voting, voting rights, getting out there. Advocating, yeah, getting and I'm not saying you got to get a Molotov cocktail and go downtown. No. I'm not saying <laughs> that. Get, but come to me with something that says, I understand your position. I want to help. And here's some ideas I have, as opposed to mm -hmm. what can I do. Before you ask me what I can suggest you do, like examine your, and I'm not speaking to you specifically, but like examine yourself and find out what strengths or resources you might have to give to whatever the cause is. To corporations, because we work for two big corporations and it is, it's, it's real in corporations. These big corporations are actually doing things. We are manager, we run businesses for these corporations. So we're actually empowered to do it as well. And diversity in our hiring is a big thing. So what are you doing with schools? And what are you doing with these corporations? Because these corporations are actually doing a lot. I don't think the schools are doing anything, personally. We've just partnered with Monmouth Medical Center. Yeah. Huge, you know, um, partnership in regard to this room, when you see it again, will be totally different of the Parker Family uh, Legacy Room. That's what this is, will be. And mm -hmm. they're um, sponsoring it, right? But it's more than what they're, that they're, you know, they're sponsoring it. It was what the um, CEO, Eric Carney, said to me in a statement that went out to the public. You know, it's not enough for us to just, you know, provide health care. If we're not aware of what's happening in these communities, what is really affecting people of color, particularly in these communities, then all the health care we're all the health care we're doing is it's not working. Got it's not going with, instead so of right, customers instead of patients. We have to be empathetic and really involved in these communities, all right? So now this partnership with us, you know, I proposed it to them because healthcare is such a issue in black community, all right? So what are we gonna do now? How, you know, what kind of um, programs can we assist Mammoth Medical with that will help them? And we're, doing, we're already doing some things with them. So. When you talked about the guys, who are, who are white guys who are afraid of losing their jobs now, or the security of their position, because we up the percentage of minorities does not change a culture. That's not diversity, that's just more black people. <laughs> you know what I mean? So the question, and, and, and it all starts with hiring more black people. We can't go anywhere until we do that. But once we do that, if we got, now we got a black guy working at a desk next to a white guy who thinks the black guy is going to take his job. So the culture might not, not only did not change, might be worse. So in addition to hiring quotas, which are absolutely necessary, we got to think about cultural changes. Yeah. So what can I implement? And I don't care if it's a goddamn company softball team. That might help, you know, where... You and this guy are in a, in a situation now that isn't corporate and structured. And you may find out, well, maybe he's not trying to take my job. Well, maybe he's, he's not. Just like me. Yeah, maybe he's, he's scared, as scared as I am. So um, I just wanted to, that's another one of those things that never gets, doesn't get said enough. I think two people raised their hand when you said you think race relations have gotten better in the last 10 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. The only the upside of what I see, and I only see one young person in this room, I won't call out Subi in the back. <laughs> <laughs> but their, their age cohort doesn't take any shit about even light joking about racist stuff, sexist stuff. It's, there's no bullshit taken by that age cohort. And, and I've seen it myself. I've had to check myself. 
when I interface with my kids and their friends. And I think I'm a pretty oh, woke. Yeah. I think I'm a pretty woke person. Yeah. Right, right, right. But uh, I'm, I'm not. Never and, <laughs> I'm not. So, and, and so I think I think we got to listen to those young people and we got to learn from them. And if people like Sophie are brave enough to talk the truth of what's out there, yeah. certainly people like me who are 57 mm -hmm. can talk to my age cohort and let them know that's just you know yeah. not okay. Yeah, yeah. You, you got to just speak up and let it let it be known. At least you let them know how where you're coming from. That everyone's not doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not it's not cool anymore. It's not okay anymore. Yeah. It's not considered cool in our culture to other people. I want to thank all of you for coming out this evening. And some of you I know signed up for tomorrow, and Candace Kelly is here tonight observing back there yes. in the back. And I want to say, can I say something? Sure, come on out. So, oh, um, can I just come? Come. I've been, I've been driving for four hours. This is uh, 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 but tomorrow, we're going to be talking about microaggressions. Microaggressions, micro insults, micro assaults. Um, and things that you should know in terms of how to get along, not only in your day to day, but inside of the classroom. Because if I say that, you know, the yacht guy is someone that can do one thing and not another thing, that can be perceived as a microaggression. If I pull on a Latino kid to ask him to help me fix something, that can be perceived as a microaggression. Because there are many people who think that Latinos are good with their hands. So there are a lot of things that we're going to learn tomorrow. Um, I have a background in law, my law degree, so that's going to be a part of it too. Because the, uh, the other thing that you want to make sure that you don't do in terms of understanding microaggressions, micro insults, micro assaults, we'll learn all about that, <laughs> is how not to get in trouble legally. Because that's ultimately what it comes to inside of your workspace, Jim. Inside right? of schools. Inside of that's schools. That's all it is. That's and right. That, and, that's and because if something happens, you, you took every, hey, listen, I made him go to yeah. safe schools, yeah. so he knew better. Right. So don't sue me. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what it comes down to. Right. So that if a teacher <laughs> says something, or even if you say something at work that is going to be misunderstood, we're going to learn everything from, you know, how you treat a woman versus someone who's LGBT, IQ, versus someone who might be black or Latino. Let's say that somebody's sleeping with somebody in the office space. That's also my progression. How? See you tomorrow. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> and one last thing. I just heard, I, I've heard a lot about um, tonight just in terms of, you know, some people don't see color. You know, we're, we're, we're blind. I was brought up to raise everybody the same way regardless of their skin color. That is a microaggression. How? Because you have to take me as a black woman. Yes. You have to take me in all of my experiences. You have to take a Native American as, a, as a, you know, in terms of experiences. You have to take the yacht guy and all of his experiences too. What's your name again? Kevin. Kevin. You have to take Kevin. All of that to consider who he is so you can figure out how do I interact with him and deal with them. Yeah. We did. Clap. <laughs>